Good afternoon. My name is Sakina Moore, and I am the program director of the Monuments Toolkit Project. On behalf of the United States Committee of the Council of Monuments and Sites and the Monuments Toolkit Project, I want to welcome you to our fifth webinar, Centering Oppressive Spaces with Digital Media. I also wanted to thank the Mellon Foundation for their generous support, without which our work would not be possible. The United States Committee of the International Council of Monuments and Sites, or US ICOMOS for short, is headquartered in Washington, DC, which is the traditional territory of the Nakotak, the Anacostan, and the Piscataway people. It is not merely enough to do a land acknowledgement, but how do we support indigenous communities into the future? With the Monuments Toolkit Project, we are looking at, at the legacies that our societies uphold and are making the links to social injustice, health injustice, and economic injustice that these monuments have come to symbolize. We do this by uplifting stories that were ignored and untold by inviting conversations as we get into these uncomfortable places. We will offer a toolkit for communities that are facing controversial and oppressive monuments, whether it is removal, reinterpretation, or recontextualization. We invite you to visit www.usicomos.org to sign up and to receive updates on the work that we are doing. Again, welcome. And I would like to introduce you to William Humphrey, Program Associate for Research and Publications, who will be moderating today's webinar. Thank you. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the fifth webinar. I'm glad that you are able to join us again on another Friday afternoon. For this month's theme, it was actually inspired by a member of the Mellon Foundation. So I'd like to again give them thanks for helping us to push these new, innovative, and difficult narratives forward. To me personally, the idea of incorporating technology into both cultural heritage and the Monuments Toolkit is fascinating. And you're able to reach both wider audiences and you're also able to introduce new tools and devices or other software that could help make things more accessible or for us to view it from a new perspective. Some of the questions that we aim to address here include, how can one gain empathy from looking at a screen or how we can really push these narratives or these messages forward when we live in different places around the world. So whether it's virtual reality, augmented reality, or other strategies that are being used today, there are a number of different ways for people to participate, to get involved and to learn more about their public spaces and their own communities. Joining us first is Rodney Freeman. Rodney Freeman has worked in academic, public, and government libraries for over 10 years and has worked in multiple positions from a library page to a library administrator. In addition, he has led several digital library projects and has been a strong advocate of diverse digital collections. Driven with passion, Rodney started Preservation LLC to help people preserve and convert their photographs and documents into digital formats. Along with starting this company in 2018, Rodney also developed a platform called the Blackmail Archives, where the objective is to capture, curate, and promote positive stories about Black men to combat the negative images portrayed in the media. Please welcome Rodney. 
Hey, thank you. Thank you guys for allowing me to speak in this opportunity just to share with you uh, uh, some of the projects that we have going on and especially talk about the Black Male Archives, which is our flagship database. So um, let me go ahead and get into it. Let me share my screen and we can go ahead and start. So the theme for this presentation is centering oppressive spaces. So I'm coming from the angle of the internet. So one of the things that I wanted to, I had this, this slogan up here called things that make you go, hmm. So if you remember back in the, I, I might be telling my age, but back in the 90s, you had Arsenio Hall say this, and it actually was a song called things that make you go, hmm. I, I dare you to look it up on YouTube and check it out. But um, one of the things that I wanted you guys just to kind of, think about, you know, what is more oppressive than the internet? Just a question that I want to throw out there, right? So when I started this Black Male Archives project, we actually started gathering stories, positive stories from um, different newspapers, and, uh, magazines, and just re-promoting those stories on our social media feeds. Um, Later on down the road in uh, last year, we turned it into actual database. But there is a question that I would like you guys to, to ask and see if you guys can actually answer this question. Between 2000 and 2012, what type of positive articles are found online about Black men? Does anybody know that answer? Well, let me give you that, that answer. It's mostly about sports. Believe it or not, in our research and our findings of gathering these positive stories, it is hard to find any positive stories outside of a sports story between 2000 and 2012. So, yeah, that says a lot about, you know, you have, that's 12 years. So you have a space where you can find stories like here and there, like one-off stories. But again, and then it could be another number of possibilities, but if, if a lot of people are using the internet and they cannot see themselves being represented in different types of uh, professions, careers, other than sports, what does that say about Black men, you know? So that's something to think about as well. Um, so how we got it started. So back in 2018, we actually started the Black Male Archives is called the Black Males and Information Profession. So myself, I'm a librarian. I've been a librarian for more than 12, 10, 13, 14 years. And um, you, I started off as a page and working my way up to a library administrator at Chicago Public Library. And, and I'm still in the library profession, but now I'm a, a librarian slash archivist. So, um, but in 2018, we just wanted to really highlight Black men in the information profession, but we found that there's so many other positive stories. So we turned it into the Black male archives and we captured all these positive stories and promote them on our social media platform. Um, so we did that into 2019. Also, you see some other, other pictures off to the left-hand side, uh, right hand side, depending on on your on your your perspective. But you see these pi two pictures: uh, computers and libraries and the preservation project. So, in 2019, I did some research, and we wanted to pull in seniors and to be able to be able to have them capture and preserve their history in a VR AR type of space. So that's what the preservation project was about. So. Uh, along when we're doing Black Male Archives, we're also dibble and dabbling with the AR, VR technology as well. So um, Black Male Archives was used in the classroom. Um, it was first used um, in dissertations. We had somebody from UCLA contact us and say, hey, we have some, some information on our website. We, we was hoping to use it by all means, please do. Um, we were also selected for the web archiving project from the Library of Congress in 2019 for the Black Mill Archives. Um, in 2020, George Floyd happened, and that really changed a lot. Uh, we, we started to ask ourselves, how can we get this resource in the hands of people that really need it the most? 
you know, um, so that's where we actually came up um, with started thinking about ways where we can get it into people's hands. And we thought about, well, I'm in the library, there's museum spaces, there's uh, academic institutions, there's school districts. So why don't we turn this thing into a full blown database where people can actually have a, a space where they can go and find these positive stories, uh, find original content of black, about black, black men, show a holistic narrative about black males. So. Uh, we did that at the uh, in the fall and winter of 2021. We launched the the Black Male Archives database. Um, in 2022 is when we started to take our database repository and actually put it into the metaverse. Um, so we created a virtual reality library, and we pushed out a demo straight to the headset where you can go into this virtual reality library, touch a kiosk. And this information about these historical significant black males will pop up and we'll show you a demo later on in the presentation about that. So background black male archives right so why so. Um, I, I There is a, a great book out there that I recommend everybody that I talk to to read called algorithms of oppression by Sophia noble. Right, and she talks about basically who are these gatekeepers that are producing these algorithms, and what are their biases, and what you know, what are their, what's their background. Um, one of the things that she did, she did some research back in 2010 where she typed in uh, a phrase uh, about black women, and she wanted to, she kind of captured the responses that she got when they, when it popped up, and. It, Nine times out of 10, it was always negative, you know, or always depicted black women in a sexualized manner. Um, and so she started to do more research about, you know, who are the gatekeepers, right? You know, um, who are the people actually, you know, creating the algorithm and, and, and pushing it out? And what it actually these, these commercialized information um, databases that we use like Google, um, uh, like uh, being, you know, what is the purpose behind them? Is it per is the purpose actually to give you um, holistic information, or is it to 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 basically um, grow their bottom line? You know, and that was one of the things that she talks about in the book. You know, a lot of these that a lot of these search engines, um, they're not there to give you. Uh, you know, just unbiased information. No, they want to make sure that they get paid, right? So that's something really to keep in mind. And out of sight, out of mind, right? Out of sight, out of mind. If you know, if they're not there on the internet, if you can't see yourself on the internet being represented, what is your point of reference? You know, what are you referring to? Um, and now everybody. Every, you know, there was a point back in the day where, you know, the internet was not in everybody's home, but now it is. So if you can't see yourself on the internet, if you can't see yourself in a positive light, how can you imagine being something greater than what you are? So um, again, that goes back to representation. It matters. Um, the Black Male Archives is showing that counter position, right? You know, um, we want to be able to show a holistic narrative about men, black men. We're not all what you see on the news, but some of us are animators, writers, producers, uh, storytellers, uh, artists, musicians, all this type of stuff. So we want to make sure that all that stuff is actually shown. We have a space. We have a space that you can actually find that information. Um, and that was one of the reasons why I was kind of glad that I was asked to, to talk about this, right? Because this is, you know, centering an oppressive space. It could be oppressive. The internet could be oppressive. Um, and, but it also could be a tool where you can highlight these stories. Um, so making this de database conscious and, you know, making it so that the, the, the narrative is shown in a holistic manner than what you see in the media. Um, nine times out of 10, some of the stories, most of the stories that I've seen in the media about Black men are, are negative. Um, and we wanted to have a space where you saw the positive. 
Um, so that's what this is. That's why we, we're doing the Black Male Archives. So centering with tech. So one of the things that we wanted to do, we wanted to make sure that we show people that, hey, yes, we are a database, but we're going to use some of this new emerging technology to, to show these stories in a different light. Um, so our folks, first off, you'll see a demo of our virtual reality library. There's no sound to it. Um, I pulled this quote uh, from James Baldwin. I am what time, circumstance, history have made of me, certainly, but I am also much more than that. So are we all? So basically, we, we're more than, like, like I said, you know, there's so much more to Black men than what you see, the one-sided news that you see day in and day out, you know? So this is the reason why we created this space. So we created this virtual reality library so you can interact with these stories. So I'm gonna show you this demo. There's no sound to it, so you won't hear any sound, but I'll walk you through it. And I'll walk you through the first station. So in this virtual reality, you're able to go in, virtual reality library, excuse me, you're able to go in, walk around, and this is a demo so people can see it, but you can touch these kiosks. So this first kiosk that you have coming up is going to talk about William T. Shorley, which is the first black, black welling captain out of Oakland. So when you touch that kiosk, you can see a, a 3D artifact representation of what would have been his, uh, his fisherman's boat, right? To the right, you can see a description of who he was. So in this demo, it's very limited to just the kiosk and interacting with the kiosk, but there is much more in this library. There's a, a lecture hall where you can hear documents. There are books that you see on the shelves that down the road, what we want to do is you'll be able to pull one of the books and actually read an ebook from the virtual reality library. Also down the road, we want to make sure that everyone has a library that they can input their own documents, MP4s, videos into this library. So that's just a little glimpse of what the virtual reality library is going to look like. So just to summarize, I don't want to take too much time, um, but, you know, this database, um, as you see to the left, that was a news article that was written about the, the Black Male Archives. Um, is this a jump, up, jump off point? Actually, we have two other databases that are coming out. The Black Male Archives is our flagship database, but we also have powerful Women of Color, which is the sister platform that talks about women of color uh, across the globe and Reminisce Historian, which actually is a genealogy database to help people to, to preserve their legacy, their family history, and share that family history, um, of course, in the database, but also within the metaverse. So um, as you can see, this is just uh, basically our, our model, our, our mission, our vision of the Black Male Archives. And it's just, it's, it's a start so we can start really being able to own our narrative, control our history, our story, um, and use some of these new emerging technologies to tell that story. So that's really it in a nutshell. Um, um, Rodney Freeman, uh, the, the business is Reminisce Preservation LLC, uh, the blackmailarchives.com. Please, please check us out. Um, powerful one of color will be out at the end of this year and reminisce historian will be out uh, later next year um, but before I go this is just I just wanted to say thank you before I, I went but I also wanted to show you um, some quick examples of what we're working on um, so the bonus round, right? Here's the bonus round. So let me show you what the actual archives is going to look like. We talked to you a little bit about the, the library, but this is the actual archives. So the one to the left is a, the building of the archives. So in the archives, it's built in a manner where we can continuously build off of it. Um, what you see here is a walkthrough of some of the rooms that we have in the archives, which really, really excited about uh, several of these rooms. But the first room up is the theater room. <clears throat> so when you go to the left, you see the theater space. So any 
docu uh, documentaries, movies that need to be shared in this space can be done in this movie room. Um, the next four rooms are exhibit halls. And um, I'm really excited to show you what we're doing with one of the exhibit halls in the next, in the next um, the, uh, example to the right. Um, again, another exhibit hall, exhibit space. Um, so these are actually going to be populated with images, with, with voiceovers, with videos, and it's going to be a new way to interact with content. Um, and what you're seeing right now, once it goes up to the stairs to the left, is the last exhibit room. And the next one, which is very, really exciting, is the recording studio. So this is for people to record oral histories, but also we are working with other content providers, uh, we're working with a gentleman who has his uh, curriculum based off of social emotional learning through hip hop. And we're gonna be using a recording studio as well to, to help uh, uh, young people tell their story through through hip hop and learn about their social uh, emotional well being through hip hop as well. So that is the archive space. Now let's check one other, and that's the one to the right. Um, and this is actually what we're doing with some of the content. So in this room, we partner with uh, a gentleman out of Ohio who's written a book called Smile for Week. It's a picture book showing positive black men smiling. So what we've done, we've taken the photos of everyone that's in the book. And what we're going to do is integrate the text and video into each photo. So it's going to be a different um, experience, right? So when you have a book and you look at it, you know, you turn the page and that's basically all. And then you have the bonus content that might be attached to that book, either on a website or you might have some materials that are physical. But now what we can do, we can take the actual book and we can attach all bonus content and extra content into the room as well. So that's something that we're building out and should be be available um, uh, early next year. So uh, yeah, that's it for me and I will turn it back over. Thank you guys. Thank you, Rodney, for the presentation. And I have quite a few things to ask you near the end. Our next panelist is Delia Sophia Zacharias. Delia Sophia is an artist writer and arts administrator whose work is rooted in accessibility, equity, community, and inclusivity. Based in Los Angeles, California, by way of Texas, she currently works at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, or LACMA, where she serves as the executive administrator and fellow in the director's office. She had first joined LACMA as the Emerging Art Professional Fellow, or through LEAP, which was part of the Diversifying Museum Leadership Initiative, funded by the Walton Foundation and the Ford Foundation. As a fellow, Dalia Sophia worked closely with museum leadership to better understand the role of encyclopedic art and cultural institution as well as their relationship with local and global audiences. She was promoted to SNAP Research Fellow in 2019 and was instrumental in developing and implementing the LACMA X Snapchat Monumental Perspectives multi-year initiative. Dalia Sophia is currently the Executive Administrator and Fellow in the Director's Office and she serves on the Board of Arts Administrators of Color Network. Please welcome her to the presentation. Thank you, William. Um, let me share my screen here. Um, all right, hopefully everyone can see. Um, yes, so I am calling in from Los Angeles, the land of the Chumash and Tongva peoples. And uh, I helped launch the multi-year initiative, uh, LACMA Time Snapchat Monumental Perspectives. Uh, really, that it's an initiative that uses augmented reality to explore monuments, murals, representation, and American history. 
Um, so we've all seen monuments uh, celebrating racist and imperialist histories toppled in the wake of the 2020 protest. And Los Angeles Younger History it just celebrated its uh, 240th birthday uh, last year allowed us to really be innovative and dive into what it means to memorialize someone or something in public spaces um, with the city and county. And as an encyclopedic art museum, we were cognizant of our role um, and um, responsibility in engaging with these current events and um, that affect our history and culture. So, uh, LACMA is no stranger to technology and social digital platforms. More than half a century ago, LACMA launched its art and technology program, bringing artists and technologies, um, technologists together for experimentation and innovation. In this last decade, we reinv um, reinvented the initiative with SNAP as an advisor. And uh, since then, we've partnered uh, on exhibitions at the museum and worked on the first augmented reality Snapchat lens to enter a museum's collection last year. So um, what we've always shared with uh, LACMA and SNAP um, is a passion of, is a passion for artists, creativity and storytelling. And after the mur murder of George Floyd in the summer of 2020, there were heightened conversations on memorialization and public spaces and museums really placed at the forefront of the conversations as cultural institutions and their own role in shaping public understanding and society. So with our understanding that it takes years for monuments to be made, um, but there really is an urgent and immediate reason to address these issues now, we expanded on our partnership with SNAP to utilize this cutting edge um, augmented reality technology to work with artists uh, on virtual monuments. Uh, our longtime partner, the Mellon Foundation, is supporting LACMA's role in monumental perspectives through their Monuments Project grant making <laughs> initiative. So with the support, LACMA is um, is able to join dozens of other organizations that are transforming the nation's commemorative landscape and exploring non-traditional expressions of commemoration. So in 2020, SNAP and LACMA began partnering with artists and lens creators to bring the digital and physical worlds together um, that, that can only be experienced through the Snapchat app. So with each virtual monument, we created various access points for people to engage with it. So we had specific uh, signage at locations. We created artist interview videos to unpack you know, each project. And uh, we included the snap codes to launch the AR monuments on our website. Of course, each project also came with its own community engagement and public program opportunities. Uh, so in consultation with community leaders and historians, we launched the first collection of artists in the spring of 2021. The inaugural cohort uh, included artists Mercedes Dorame, Ayer Bach, Glenn Kaino, Ruben Ochoa, and Ada Pinkston, who examined key moments, figures, and monumentality in the region's past and present. And the second collection uh, that launched last year, or earlier actually, earlier this year, sorry, um, include artists Judy Baca, Sandra de la Loza, and Constant Glee. And it's the three um, images that you see on the bottom right. Um, and for today's presentation, I'm actually gonna be focusing on three out of the eight projects. So focusing on Ruben Ochoa's Vendedores Presentes, uh, Ada Pinkston's The Open Hand is Blessed, and Kang Sang Lee's uh, La Revolución es la Solución. So the first case study is Ruben Ochoa's Vendedores Presentes. And Vendedores Presentes really responds to LA's complex history with street vendors. Uh, Ruben draws from his family history. His uh, mother pioneered a uh, mobile tortilla delivery system in San Diego County to really pay homage to the critical role of street vendors in LA's culture and economy. 
Uh, so when there is presente, uh, dives into SNAP's playful lenses and brings out a vibrant color scheme as it references familiar uh, forms of street vending. So you see the fruit cart, you see the paleta cart, the corn on the cob floating around, and um, you see the flower buckets and, and the oranges. Um, so this air monument may be experienced at MacArthur Park uh, or from anywhere if you download Snapchat <laughs> and you scan the code on the screen. And uh, really trying to make it as accessible as possible for everyone who it may not be in LA. <laughs> so it, it was important for Ruben Ochoa for Vendores Presentes to also serve as a multilingual resource for on the ground entrepreneurs and a call for advocacy. So after a decade long fight to legalize street vending in LA, the pandemic really impacted its progress and potential growth. So it left a lot of street vendors more vulnerable than ever. So the lens also offers the opportunity to link out to these specific resources that you see on the screen um, for people to just engage more and learn more about uh, street vending. We also invited participants to learn more about the plight of street vendors and provide options to assist through nonprofit organizations organizations such as Community, Community Power Collective and Inclusive Action for the City. Aside, alongside the community leaders, we created and distributed a specific marketing campaign and developed a docu-series in which we interviewed um, Aurelio Santiago, Merlin Alvarado, and Pedro Barillas. And this documentary series is actually available on LACMA's YouTube channel, should be should you be interested after today's talk. Um, and Ruben even went a full step further and expanded on the project um, to create a fundraising print uh, opportunity that directly supports the initiative of Inclusive Actions Emergency Los Angeles Street Vendor Campaign. So the funds um, from each individual print uh, translate directly to cash cards for street vendors and their families, many who were not able to receive direct pandemic relief funds from the government. And as of September 2022, earlier this year, or a few months ago, um, we uh, the proceeds go towards the funding of street vendors travel to Sacramento to represent, advocate, and provide testimonials to help pass um, a bill on the assembly floor. Um, the next case study is Ada Pinkston's The Open Hand is Blessed. The Open Hand is Blessed is a memorial series that pays tribute to the voice and spiritual philosophy of Biddy Mason. The story of Mason is one of resilience. In 1851, Biddy uh, Mason arrived in San Bernardino, California after traveling thousands of thousands of miles by foot as an enslaved person. After this journey, she settled in Los Angeles and worked as a nurse and midwife and fought for her freedom. Uh, she died a free person and one of the wealthiest black women in the country. Um, my very brief summary here does not do any justice to her life, um, but I invite you to uh, you know, explore the lens, the AR monument and uh, learn more about her history in depth. So um, the open hand is blessed. Uh, Ada, Center, Ada Pinkston centers a portrait uh, of Biddy Mason and archival images of African-American residents in the 19th century um, in Los Angeles among this floating orb uh, overlaid with these soft watercolor hues. Uh, the artist considers orbs to be light energies and fragments of a person's memory. So she ex examines recent images of sound and space and contemplated, you know, what happens to these particles of a person when they move on and how, it, you know, its impact on the space and memory of a person. So Ada Pinkston created over 90 different watercolor paintings that represent an ever moving energy source uh, to be digitally incorporated into this AR lens. Um, this specific AR monument can be experienced at Magic Johnson Park, or if you've already downloaded your Snapchat app, you can scan the code on the bottom right image here. Um, 
And it was really important to note that Ada was looking at her AR monument located at the park above this lake so that users could interact with the water while facing downtown LA where Biddy Mason's home is commemorated by um, a memorial park. So this is Biddy Mason's Memorial Park in downtown. And it is a bit hidden behind a parking lot, a little bit obscure, but Ada Pinkston took advantage of the augmented reality's potential uh, to create space for public interaction and conversation outside this brick and mortar architecture that we usually see in monumental spaces. So she also shared that as an artist, she had a lot more freedom uh, and a lot more flexibility to re-render the past because she's not approaching it as a historian or as an anthropologist or archeologist. Um, she's really thinking how to humanize an experience in a way that can that is a little bit more accessible and um, creative. Uh, in the third case study, um, we do have uh, Kang Seng Lee's La Revolución es la Solución. Uh, Kang Seng Lee revisits um, his body of work made at Art Pace in San Antonio in 2017, in which he engages with recent history through a methodical process of redrawing imagery from community-based archives. So, La Revolución es la Solución stems from activist responses to the 1991 murder of Latasha Harlings, a 15-year-old African-American girl who was shot by the owner of the Empire Liquor Store. Um, Lee uses uh, kites associated with Korean memorial services and New, uh, New Year's celebration to really map out the responses of activists initiated by community leaders after Harlan's death. So Lee utilizes, let me see if it plays. Ah, there we go. Uh, Lee utilizes uh, this transformational and lyrical quality of animation to map uh, virtual kites onto the sky. These kites flutter between the pain of the past and the hope of you know, for alliances and actions across communities into the future. Uh, la Revolución es la Solución is experienced at Algin uh, Southern Recreation Center, which is a block away from where the Empire Liquor Store used to be. Um, uh, let me see. Ah. How do I go to the next one? Mm, sorry. There you go. Um, because Lee wishes to amplify the voices and actions of activist leaders who have worked across racial and class lines to rebuild their communities, each kite has a different resource you can learn more about. So uh, the kites that we saw in the last video, um, it's very user friendly and uh, I guess dynamic <laughs> that users will be able to click each kite and um, these screenshots will appear. So these additional resources. So while his project was originally conceived for the 25th anniversary of the 92 LA uprising, it has been reconfigured to document the ongoing work of the Latasha Harlings Foundation, K-Town um, -Town 92, Mothers Reclaiming Our Children, as well as Central American Refugee Center uh, for the 30th anniversary of the LA uprising um, earlier this year. Um, and I think to just wrap, wrap up <laughs> the, the three case studies here, um, monuments tell really specific stories about histories and this project, this initiative is an occasion for artists and lens creators to engage with stories that need that need to be told and rethink how we consider history from a more inclusive um, perspective. Um, many of us understand and contextualize social movements and histories through art and we're delighted by the experimentation and innovation and creativity inherent in art. And um, it's been an incredible opportunity to be part of the project that fuses art and technology um, to, to reclaim these histories. And um, 
it's something that's very dear to my heart. I'm continuously uh, working on it. It is an ongoing series. So um, very excited that, you know, through monumental perspectives, artists and technologists have really helped us reimagine what monuments and commemoration sites can look like and can be. So uh, I appreciate you here, uh, you know, letting me ramble on about monumental perspectives. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Delia Sophia. And now we are reaching the Q&A portion of the webinar. So I'd like to also welcome back Rodney Freeman. And uh, the audience, you may please submit your questions by using the Q&A function on Zoom. And after review, I will pitch them to both of our panelists and we can begin the discussion. In the meantime, I wanted to ask both of you that in visualizing moments of strife, enlightenment, or other community values, do you believe that your projects are drawing a relationship between users and the history or narratives that they're encountering for the first time in this digital space? I'll, I'll, I'll go first if, if you don't mind. Okay, so yes, I do, uh, short answer. Um, and one of the reasons why I was actually uh, demoing this uh, database at a, I think it was a male engagement uh, for back to school. And a young male came up to me, young man came up to me and was just like, um, yeah, you probably wouldn't have anything that I'm interested in. In, in your in your database i was like well what are you interested in he was like drag racing and i was like oh okay well you know let's let's see so we were able to find a story about a one-armed drag racer a black man who was drag racing and you know it's is that what that's actually what gets me when people actually use the database and they can find that resource you know and i think that maybe it just goes back to me being a librarian and helping people find resources but you know it really it does brighten my day to see people use it and see that when the way i was able to see him kind of light up to see a man who was who only had one arm of drag racing and he knew how hard it was just to drag race with two arms so you know he really had a, a reverence for this gentleman that he found and it was just like wow you know and and after that he started looking but it was it was um it's a number of people that are able to use it and just be able to identify with the stories and that they haven't heard anywhere else um i think is really important so so yes i mean i i i'd like to think so yes uh i i will say i, I am proof <laughs> that I um, that these story that these opportunities they these AR monuments you know really do help just illuminate what what the his the various histories of Los Angeles I am not an LA native and um, learning about all of these stories through these artists and the projects that um, they're working through I got to relearn history and unlearn a lot of <laughs> our, our mainstream history, if you will. So um, if I had that personal connection, I know um, a lot of um, our audiences um, have been able to engage in, um, with the technology and the histories behind it. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I also find it very fascinating that um, near the end of both of your presentations, you both kind of touched on the idea of controlling the narrative or taking ownership of how um, communities are being portrayed. So I, I also feel that that's another important feature that both of your projects are contributing towards. Um, Jim Carrier asks, do you think young people will read long narratives or should civil rights stories be reduced to short videos such as Instagram, TikTok, or Twitter? Go ahead. Yeah, no, uh, that's a great question. Thank you, Jim. I, I don't think it should be reduced to anything. Um, I think it can work simultaneously um, with, <laughs> with other platforms. I think the beauty of monumental perspectives 
you know, having it be on Snapchat, the Snapchat application is that it's an access point, it's an entry point. And of course, you know, it is, um, it's an access point for a broader and more thorough investigation of each event, person, and history that we're trying to, to cover through this project. Yeah, I, I am definitely in agree, agreement with my panelists. It should not be reduced. However, I do think there is, is opportunities to do some uh, one-offs and some in some uh, lighter versions, you know, uh, one of the things that we do for our YouTube channel is that we condense the video down to like three minutes, and then we put the 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 whole entirety of the interview behind, you know, in the archives. But we also then do like one offs, like uh, a ten minute podcast or a ten minute video or a five minute video, but using still using that long form version of of the of the article or the piece or whatever so you still want to keep that but you can also do some other offshoots around that so no it shouldn't be reduced but there's opportunities to do you know smaller media uh content around it for rodney i wanted to ask um one moment okay at the end of your presentation, you mentioned the plan incorporation of hip hop or spoken word overall the vernacular tradition. And I thought it was exciting that you're going to incorporate that into the digital space. I even remember in the past, the Library of Congress had hosted like an online turntable or music, mis mm -hmm. music mixing yep. software. Yep. But yep. I wanted to ask that now that the focus is on preserving and controlling the image of black men, are there other traditions that you're considering for this archive? And also, I wanted to add, um, are there any plans for users to interact with each other? Or will each trip into the Blackmail archives focus on a single personal experience? Oh, that's a good question. So let me add, let me tackle that one first. Um, no, we are actually uh, wanting to develop where you're able to have interactions just like a roblox or or fortnite type of atmosphere so uh, gamifying the the environment um and also we find that uh, collaboration exploring and all that good stuff um so so to answer that one yeah we do want to make sure that people will be able to interact with it um now to say well that's later down the road at one point, we do want this. We do want the library to be um, a, a platform for people to save their their digital content. Um, so, how we integrate that? That's going to be interesting. Where each user will have their own part of the library or their own library to have their own digital content, PDFs, MP3s, all you name it, and be able to take some of that or NFTs, right? And be able to take that back and forth throughout in between different types of games so you know you can have an nft that you can carry into roblox and you can carry into minecraft that you can carry into fortnite um but that's something down the road um so in the the first question i believe you asked um give me that question one more time i'm an old man <laughs> all good the first question was oh i actually pulled them from two different um the first question was are there other traditions that are being considered for the black male archive because we have we're, you're incorporating vernacular so i was wondering um is there is there anything else in the works that might help for people to celebrate black culture or their family's traditions it's funny that you asked me that because we just actually before what two hours ago i got off the phone with the museum in, in cincinnati talking about what we can create around that but i can't really share that right now because we're in the works with that but yes there is um however we're we're really wanting to build this out um with this hip-hop curriculum um for right now but um we we do smaller projects i don't want to say smaller projects but we do projects for um some of our clients um, that are not uh, hip hop related that might use other forms. And that's all I can say about that right now. 
Okay, thank you. <laughs> I wanted to ask uh, Delia Sophia, do you know? Um, I I saw on the on the third case study you mentioned that the the work was close to the location where the girl was murdered. But I wanted to also ask that when you pitched this collaboration with Snapchat to your artists, were there any renditions of the AR that were either inspired or one-to-ones of other tangible spaces or monuments that's in your series? Uh, I, yeah, so when we first pitched, um, or we first reached out to artists and pitched this opportunity, um, to use augmented reality, we more or less focused on the augmented reality technology and its capabilities, um, just because most of the artists that we have been working with um, were not as familiar um, with augmented reality and the use of it um, within their own artistic practice. So we wanted to kind of break break the <laughs> the confines of what a monument could look like and share what AR can do, really thinking outside of the box. So we shared a lot more intangible <laughs> um, artworks and monuments and um, projects that Snapchat um, has had already been working on to really share what could be possible. In terms of tangible monuments um, and references, um, not, not really. I think each artist, you know, when they were doing their research on their own specific project and event, of course they referenced what was already um, created, not just in Los Angeles, but throughout the US, what kind of memorial sites were, were dedicated to their specific projects, but, um, I think in the second site or in the second case study with um, Ada Pinkston, she does reference Biddy Mason's Memorial Park, but um, the locations and really trying to think outside that brick and mortar, you know, uh, monumental sphere that we usually think about. So, uh, so yeah, it was more augmented reality than, than tangible <laughs> spaces. <laughs> Do you also think that, um, actually, could you describe some of the most memorable reactions that you've seen to the AR monuments? And are, are these reactions coming from Snapchat stories that are maybe responses to um, the project? Or are people able to share videos like on top of what they're able to scan into the app? Yeah, so um, people all, Snapchat is a global, <laughs> globally accessible um, uh, app. So, you know, we do have people all around the world engaging with these projects um, because it is a lens. Uh, you can record like any other augmented um, Snapchat lens. You can record the your experience of seeing the AR monument, which is really great because then we get all of these um, uh, unique, <laughs> unique uh, experiences that people have in their own backyards, engaging with the air monument, or you know, in the middle, you know, during the during school, during work, in the office. Um, so that's really exciting. But um, I think something that stands or stays with me, and I will hold very close to my heart, is when we were working with Kong Sung Lee's on the memorial for Latasha Harleen's, you know, we wanted to be very sensitive with, to the family, right? To the family, to um, Latasha Harleen's foundation, because, it, because as, you know, based in Los Angeles, it's something that is very uh, close and very, very much, you know, while it happened 30 years ago, it's very much still a conversation, very much, um, part of current events today. So when Kong Sung Lee, you know, approached us and we were like, and proposed to revisit his research on LA uprisings and his memorial on Latasha Harleen's, 
we really um, wrapped our brains around, you know, trying to make this um, as collaborative as possible. So we talked to Latasha Hartman's foundation, we talked to her family, and uh, once we were able to launch the experience, um, I remember her family coming out to one of our public program events and, you know, very moved, being very moved that we were able to, the artist constantly, with the help of the technology, was able to reimagine uh, a new way to memorialize um, Latasha. And it's something that's a story that's very near to, you know, South LA, to LA in general, and very uh, precedent in today's um, events. So, you know, another opportunity to keep Latasha's story alive and her memory alive. So uh, that was very touching. And I think some of the most moving uh, moments I've shared with audience members or engaging with these monuments. Yes, my thoughts as well. I would like to ask you both. Um, well, first I'll start by saying, uh, Alexa, stop, sorry. Uh, it has often been said that digital media will never replace genuine experiences. And in understanding today's discourse around oppressive monuments and civil rights, do you believe that this technology can help audiences understand the complexities of contention around their public spaces? I'll go. Um, I believe so. Um, one of the things about these with these new technologies, with these new technologies, it can you can add more information, you can add um, more context to it. Um, yeah. Not saying that it needs it, but you can display uh, additional um, um, resources to to show um, people meanings behind certain things. Um, so I do feel like uh, with AR. Uh, with VR, you're able to to kind of have added information resources right there at your fingertips. Mm. Excuse me. Um, I don't think it can re ever replace the actual physical thing. Um, uh, I think it is something to be said to actually go to a place and see it. And we, <laughs> I think, from this pandemic, we all have that 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 uh, travel bug in us because we weren't able to go many places. And yes, we did use some of this newer technology, but we knew it can't, it can, it can never replace that human interaction that you get, you know, being able, take for instance, being able to hear my grandfather talk about how he was part of the Red Ball Express, you know, and, and sit down next to him and, and ask him, these type of questions where there there is technology that's out there that's using AI where you can actually interview somebody who is not no longer living. However, um, there, there will be limitations. There's always going to be limitations with technology. So um, yes, it's a good thing. It's a good tool, but does it replace us or um, the human interaction? No, that's just my thoughts. Yeah, I mean, yes, definitely echoing what uh, Rodney said. Um, I also think that monumental perspectives is unique that, you know, we focus on histories and events in Los Angeles. So um, as someone who's based in Los Angeles, I think, you know, you do have offer like the other um, perspective of, or just other opportunities to engage with these sites and these events. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, echoing what Rodney said. <laughs> I know we're at time, so I'm <laughs> trying to keep it concise. <laughs> oh, we, we actually have quite a bit left. Oh, so okay, like sorry. Expand, <laughs> you can. can I add something real quick too? Yeah, mm -hmm. certainly. Excuse me, my, uh, you know, one of the things about being in the library world, we are, um, you know, we, we, and I'm, I'm a part of it as well. We like to make sure that we preserve it by digitization, right? And put it out there online so people can access the information. Um, so you might, I, I, I just want to give an example of like some of these documents that these historical significant documents that are, when you touch them, they crumble. So you, 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 you scan them and you, you put them in a repository and, um, 
it's good to have for prosperity and make sure that you know you can always access it but it will never i i've seen time and time again where i've been in institutions where i've seen people who might have seen the object in a digital as a digital object but when they actually go to a place to actually physically see it it's a whole different type of emotion so that's another thing that you don't get with you know with some of this newer technology yes you know you might get the you know that uh that uh, initial you know is, is new and everything but you know to a certain aspect you know that you're not in a you know you're in a uh animated environment a virtual environment you're not in the real world so when you actually go and see this object for yourself and if you can put your actual hands on it that was i think it was so powerful that lizzo went to the library of congress and actually played the flute of what james madison right it was so powerful that's why so many people talked about it because she got to touch something that was back what 200 200 some odd years old or whatever so yeah i just want to add that you know it can never be replaced yeah no and i mean also the augmented reality i think how you rodney how you mentioned your virtual reality like there's a uh, digital recording space the ability to integrate other um, mm -hmm. educational opportunities so in some of our monuments we have soundscapes we have as in the last case study i shared we have additional resources and links to other mm -hmm. um more ex expansive um, engagement. Uh, so yeah. while it, I don't think we'll ever replace the in-person, you know, uh, for those that already have, uh, you know, very specific monuments, um, tangible mm -hmm. monuments, um, I think it creates a very immersive, um, out of the box educational experience that yeah. for a lot of his, uh, histories and events um, don't have those tangible spaces right now. That's true, yeah. That's true. Do you both think that the rise of social media is creating more platforms for the celebration of culture, community, and to, again, reclaim these narratives? I, I remember quite a few years ago, uh, Black Twitter had been sharing uh, jumping the broom wedding pictures, and I think there was a mm -hmm. hashtag around that. And I've also mm -hmm. seen in other communities, they've been using the hashtags to share certain moments, and then others mm -hmm. users will see it and they'll contribute and it leads to this mini archive of different experiences. And I, mm -hmm. I was wondering, do you think with all the exposure we get from social media, is there a growing respect for these cultures? I'm gonna take a stab at it because <laughs> the reason why I'm smiling because I'm I'm I have first of all I want to say that the people who are, are are capturing these images and sharing these images out there on social media, great work. And I think that needs to be done, right? Um I do have some 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 issues with it because they're sharing the work on platforms that are not owned by them or owned by people where they can actually control who gets to see it. We have we have seen time and time again how some of these platforms can change the algorithm and show only a sliver of what you're putting out there. And that's what I actually have. Uh, issue with more than they're them doing it. I think they're them, they're doing a good job by putting it out there and making sure that promoting the culture and showing positive stories along with some of the <laughs> other stuff that's being uh, out there. But I have an issue with the 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 I guess the man behind the curtain type of thing. You know, we'll 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 turn the algorithm just a little bit and then only like a fraction of the friends that you have get to see the content that you're putting out there until you pay us. <laughs> so so that is, I think, well, I'm kind of, you know, yeah, I love it. But then again, I know, you know, how it actually works too, so. Yeah, no, it's spot on. <laughs> I, yeah. I agree. You know, one of the, the, the things that I see with Web three versus you know Web two was is that I see more people of color being able to create 
and have ownership in uh, in some of these web web three products where in web two not that many <laughs> so you know so I do feel like people of color having ownership and creating some of these these platforms and these NFT marketplaces is is a good thing because you know then this is just my opinion but then when they develop that website out more and more they always have that diversity mindset at the forefront you know and not as like an afterthought oh now we need to think about diversity <laughs> you know whereas it was already it's always already baked into to the to the actual platform so part of what you're both saying is um the exposure is good but there has to be if if the platform wasn't already established with a already set level of sensitivity or or um citation ownership that's being given to what's being shared then of course people can manipulate that for themselves or manipulate the traffic, like you said, uh, to those posts. So I do think that's some serious food for thought as well. I yeah, because also I, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say at the end of the day, you know, these these companies are businesses, right? And you know, right. Um, we understand what a business is, um, but we also have to understand that you know. I, I do feel like when you you come in with a different lens uh perspective on 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 things you kind of keep that at the forefront you know when you're creating so you know as I'm creating my company um I at the forefront you know I'm definitely thinking about people of color you know um yes you know at the end of the day I do need to make sure <laughs> we can pay our bills but I'm also making sure at the same Right there, you know, we have showing positive images and stories of people of color. So, yeah. What were some of the challenges that you both came into contact with while learning how to utilize AR and VR software in your projects? Um, well, I think one of the maybe not challenges, but one of the blessings, I guess, is having such a close partner with SNAP um, because we've been working with SNAP for you know, a few years now. Uh, we were able to go into this initiative um, with their technological expertise and support. So um, while we did you know, engage with our own um, tech conservators and um, experts in the field within the museum, um, you know, no one knows SNAP technology <laughs> as best as SNAP. <laughs> so we were very fortunate to uh, develop and continue a very strong relationship where, you know, they, they really handle and take lead on all of the technical side, uh, technical, technical components to this development of AR uh, monuments. So, uh, yeah. I, I didn't have to learn how to code, which I was very thankful for, <laughs> but the lens creators at times would share their screens during meetings and whew, um, it looked um, very intimidating. <laughs> so I uh, appreciated um, the SNAP team for, for every everything that they were doing. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> it, it, it was interesting for me because I actually had to, uh, learn uh, how to use um, uh, Unity and build out uh, platforms in Unity from YouTube videos and piecemealing the videos and staying up. And then um, even when we did uh, a beta testing of our, our, our app, you know, um, I worked with a contractor, but I had to tell the contractor what I wanted. So that means then I need to go back to the drawing board and learn how to design, you know, wireframes, which, you know, I didn't know how to do none of that. So the the the, the good thing though, is that I was able to find that information <laughs> out there and kind of teach myself. Um, but the stuff that I still don't know how to do to this day, um, um, I am better when I talk to contractors, knowing and telling them what I want. Now, if I don't understand something, of course I ask, but 
uh, also I know how to go ahead and research and, and, and find that information. So it was really, it wasn't a challenge. It was actually a great opportunity to, to learn some skills. Um, and it, it helps me to, again, like I said, um, to kind of go further with some of the different technologies that we're, we're looking at, even with, with our company, you know, with the AR and then also with AI and also with linked data and all this type of other good stuff. So, so yeah. That's great. Um, I'll ask one more question and I'll field for maybe one more from our audience and then we can wrap up the event. But for my final question, uh, I wanted to ask that with the, the educational resources or opportunities that you both mentioned for learning, um, is there a potential to elevate these discussions, not just in virtual reality or through augmented reality, but to take a lot of the, the discussions around monuments, identity, and culture and to bring those up to a higher platform, like maybe councils, maybe um, you no know, lawmaking, uh, lawmaking decisions. And if we're able to facilitate these with this technology, you think we have a shot at really bringing the voices of the community to the table more with this technology. I'm gonna take a stab at this one, and I'm gonna try to <laughs> I try to show it through through uh, an example that I have. So, a couple of weeks ago, I was at Asala, um, and Asala is a African American uh, history uh, is a Carter G. Woodson organization on Black history, and um, I was presenting. Well, not really presenting, but I was a vendor there, and. Um, the night after that, we went to a bar and I was sitting next to a couple of people who were from Purdue. And they, we had just sparked up a conversation about the metaverse, right? And they were asking, and this is the point that I'm trying, I'm, you, you're gonna see it come out, but they were asking if we could do a hybrid, right? So they were actually from the aviation school. And what they wanted to do is take some of these big, uh, airplane manuals and basically put them into a virtual reality environment that has live buttons, right? So because in aviation, you need to know what type of buttons you need to pull from the aviation manual. And in, in that element, they would a be able to train some of their, their, their pilots greater, with greater speed, with greater accuracy than they could uh, actually waiting for uh, an actual plane to come in and then show them the buttons and go and walk them through the manual. <clears throat> so I say that, that there's opportunity like, basically like that, where you're able to create these hybrids, right, between the real world and this, these educational training resources, right? So take, for instance, you want to be a truck driver and you're able to have a truck dri driver's manual inside of this element and be able to learn trucking, you know, by using a VR headset. Um, so yeah, I, I do think that it, then it could be raised to a different standard, right? And, and create certain policies around it, which I already feel like they're starting to to kind of think about regulations and everything around around the metaverse. But um, I do see the uses for this type of technology around training and. Uh, being able to engage people um, that's going to have this educational um, resource, but output, right, that's qu that's quicker than your traditional method. So, so yeah, long story short, yes. <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, that's spot on, <laughs> Rodney. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, augmented reality and has really allowed us, or the museum at least, to re rethink, you know, how we look at, you know, 
what the artists are doing and how they're responding to um, our current events um, or history. Um, so it's very, uh, it's very exciting. And uh, I can only imagine, <laughs> you know, how, how this project and this initiative is really pushing us and challenging challenging us and curator us as a museum but curators you know administrators um historians all the works to to rethink how we look at and engage with museums right museums you know traditionally are a little you know stuffy a little old <laughs> um and uh, how how do museums you know keep relevancy you know as the world is changing so quickly and as you know as historically and culturally, you know, we're put under a microscope of what does being an inclusive and representative institution look like, right? So I think augmented reality is really pushing us, um, technology as a whole is really pushing us to explore uh, new accessibility um, points and features. So we'll see. <laughs> and to continue on both of your points and the monuments toolkit that we have, we one of the challenges we're often thinking about is how to enable or empower local communities to take ownership or to reassess their local spaces, their monuments, their structures that have been under contention. And I agree with both of your points that this technology would be very useful in terms of training or in terms of simulating scenarios. Like let's say for instance, maybe there's an AR or VR experience that helps you um, contact or fill out certain forms, contact the people or organizations that, you know, may be affiliated with these monuments or these structures. Uh, ways to move through the system legally or to even educate others about some of the monuments that might be almost in their backyard, but they just don't know. So I am excited that there's so much potential that can be capitalized on. And I also would like to say that I think the inspiration that comes from projects like yours is just as important. You know, we don't have the answers now, but as things continue to develop, uh, soon people will be asking our questions. They might even be asking questions that we never even thought about. So I'd like to thank you both for joining our program. It was a pleasure seeing both of your presentations. And I would like to welcome back Director Sakina Moore to close us out. Thank you. Thank you, William. I wanted to thank Rodney Freeman and Del Delia Sofia Zacharias for your insightful presentations. I also wanted to extend gratitude for everyone who attended today and also the Mellon, the Mellon Foundation for your generous support. Please follow us on www.usicomos.org and be sure to join us for our November webinar entitled The Destruction of Monuments Against Indigenous People. At the end of this webinar, you will receive a brief survey. As we continue to offer more programming, we welcome your feedback to make your experience better. Thank you very much and have a great weekend.